Okay, no questions. So let me recap a little bit. Uh, so you started talking about decision theory and um, went through some examples. So you have a, you start with a probability model, uh, which is um, a collection uh, of probability distributions parameterized by some parameter theta uh, in some parameter space omega. And these probability distributions are distributions for your data x, which is uh, uh, belongs to some sample space. And then there's an action space, which for us almost exclusively will be the same as the parameter space. And an action is just an estimate of the parameter. And um, examples are zero one loss and quadratic loss. So the statistical uh, inference can be viewed as a game where the two players, nature picks the parameter, picks the distribution, and generates the data from that distribution. So X is a random element with distribution P theta. Um, and then pass it to the statistician. The statistician observes it and then makes a decision. Delta X, so it has a decision rule. Um, that's the job of the statistician to come up with the decision rule, or like this, you can call it the estimator. If you ima imagine the action is just an estimate, to map observations to estimates of the parameter. And then we incur as a statistician the loss L theta of delta X. Uh, L theta and delta x, and then the expectation of this loss is the risk, and then the expectation depends um, on theta uh, because the distribution depends on theta. So the expectation is taken under the distribution of x. So um, that's uh, why you put a theta to remind ourselves that this is under um, p theta. And so this risk will be a function of both theta and delta. Delta now is the decision rule, okay? Uh, not the particular value uh, of the estimate, uh, but the mapping that maps observations to the estimate. So it depends on um, that rule. And then we want to evaluate the, the different decision rules. We went over this, um, actually we did this example, uh, simple normal, uh, this is called the location, normal location family. Um, I'll come back to this later, maybe just in the passing. But uh, we did the Bernoulli example where you could flip a coin n times and you observe the sequence of observations of uh, what happened to the coin, which we can uh, encode as a binary sequence. Uh, in this case, you can set it up. Um, but the thing is, we end up working with uh, ended up working with the joint PMF probability mass function, which has a simple form. And um, we'll come back to this later. But for the particular example that we did, we didn't even need the uh, joint distribution or this particular form. We put a quadratic loss and then evaluated a couple of estimators. Um, and so our sample mean is, for example, a particular decision rule um, that takes the average of these um, uh, observations. Uh, and then there were other uh, competing ones and then we calculated the risk or just waved our hands uh, around. Uh, but for the sample mean, we actually calculated using the sort of bias variance decomposition, which I'm getting um, into today as well. Uh, but in the end, the end result is that our estimators, uh, the risk of decision rules or estimators depend on theta and uh, comparing them is not necessarily um, easy or conclusive. So we plotted these risks and we could see that we could rule out, for example, delta four, which just throws out all the data except the first one because it's dominated, the four is dominated by delta one. Um, but for the other ones, it's not yet easy, that easy to do it. Even the, the basic, basically the constant estimator, which is seems to be very uh, naive, uh, it is not possible to rule it out without further. Um, constraints. Um, and so in order to um, fix the issue, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, one is to summarize these risks by a number. Uh, um, this leads to the Bayesian and uh, 
minimax type of optimality. And the other one is to restrict the class of estimators, which we'll do first um, after we talk about a couple of other concepts. Uh, and then there's this other idea of just rule out all the, the ones that are dominated by others. Uh, and this is uh, sometimes referred to as a complete class theorem. So you keep all the estimators that are admissible and just end the story there. So just point out that if you see complete class theorems, uh, they would say that, for example, certain set of estimators form a complete class, which means that they cover all the admissible estimators. Yes. Theorems. We'll see examples of this later in a simple context. But any questions so far? So I'm going to maybe just make this a little bit more precise, then uh, uh, move on to like some preliminary ideas related. First, we will define the bias and then talk about sufficiency. And then we move on to, we'll, we'll build this. What is, what is um, the best uh, possible estimator under the quadratic loss in the class of unbiased estimate. So that's something that we, we're going to work towards. But in, in working, like in trying to get there, we'll, we need some tools that are of independent interest. Okay. Sufficiency, minimal sufficiency, completeness. So this is something that we're going to build towards. OK, so admi in admissibility. So this is the definition of admissibility. Suppose you have two decision rules, delta and delta star. Uh, delta star is said to strictly dominate delta if um, um, these two conditions hold. So the risk of delta star is everywhere uh, less than or equal to the risk of delta means for all theta. Um, and a strict holds if the second condition also holds. Like there is at least one point, one theta, for which this inequality is a strict. Then you say it strictly um, dominates. So delta starts to get dominates, uh, and then delta is going to be inadmissible. Uh, if there is a delta star different from it that makes it or dominates it. So if that's the case, if there is another delta star that dominates it, then it's inadmissible. Otherwise, it's admissible. In other words, an inadmissible rule can be uniformly improved. Uniformly means um, for all values of theta, uh, or at least not beta. So, uh, sorry, beat either like improved or at least as good as some other thing. Uh, so, in the in the Bernoulli example, inadmissible. We saw an example. Delta four was inadmissible. We'll, we'll see another one, which is not trivial. Shortly. Um, but that's the definition of inadmissibility, okay? Um, any questions? Okay, so let's move on to the bias. The bias is um, yeah, like a fundamental concept in, let's say, theory of statistics. So an estimator, um, so let's say delta is an estimator or a decision rule for estimating g theta. So now we are allowing ourselves to estimate other parameters other than theta. Um, there's like minimal um, changes. I mean, there's there's no issue with trying to estimate something else. Um, so the bias of delta, so let's say delta, imagine like the action was very general. So my action is an estimate of g theta. Um, so the bias of delta for estimating g theta is this quantity. Okay, so uh, it is the expectation of the decision rule. So when I write something like this, it's just a compact uh, form. It's a little bit of a um, imprecise thing because delta is a decision rule. But what I mean really is this expectation of delta x. For simplicity, it just drop the x. So you evaluate delta at x. That's your estimate of G theta, yes. And then uh, we take the expectation. Yeah. What's G? It's just some function of theta. Suppose I want to estimate, for example, let's say I want to estimate G theta squared rather than theta. Okay. 
Um, usually it's just theta, but you can estimate any other function. So the bias is essentially like how long our estimation is the theta on average? Uh, you can say that, yes. On average, uh, if you treat the expectation, think of the expectation as an average, yes, on an average. Or the mean, basically. So if is the mean of it is correct. If it's an unbiased estimator, then that means on average it's a correct estimator. Uh, yes, these, these statements are all sort of correct, but depends on how you want to interpret on average, right? Um, if you just observe one x, the expectation doesn't help you much, right? So if you just observe, let's say I, um, um, in, in the example that we had, for example, suppose you have um, x1 up to xn, they're Bernoulli. Um, theta, right? Suppose I just give you one observation, x1, okay? And then your um, estimate of theta would be x1, right? Um, and so this is an estimator of theta. So the expectation of this guy, what is the expectation? Excellent. Uh, the, it's the expectation of X1, but what is it? No, it's just going to be theta because it's a Bernoulli distribution. So X1 is Bernoulli. Suppose I just give you one one of them, or just the, the, the one that shows everything else. So you, you observe one point flip. You want to estimate theta, you just estimate it as x1, just the observation that you saw. Um, the expectation is theta. Right? So it's unbiased, but it's not very useful. There's no averaging going on, right? Um, if you happen to observe, like if you repeat the experiment many times, right, on average, uh, this is going to be correct, but making sense of the on average is not. Um, easy. But I leave it at that. So um, it's just that the expectation, on expectation, it matches the parameter. Okay. Whether that expectation means anything. There is a connection via the law of large numbers, but um, you should be a little bit careful. Yeah. How did you just bring in from the previous notations? So the, the, the action uh, action x can we interpret this as theta hands like, without the, like, the... Yeah, the action, um, you can think of the action as theta hat, or in this case, the hat of this, so an estimate of this, right? But... Um, or G theta hat. No, not G theta. So theta is a parameter. G theta is a new parameter. And this is, we can think of delta x as, yeah, yeah, let's call this, I don't know, a new parameter, psi, if you want. Then delta of x, uh, this guy, you can call it like psi hat, okay? The, the formalism is good, but it might be a bit too much for our case. It's just, you can think of these as estimators of whatever parameter that you're trying to estimate. So this is a random quantity. This is not. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions? Other questions about the bias? It's a tricky notion. Um, the statisticians traditionally really liked bias, um, being unbiased. So unbiased. So first, unbiasedness means this whole. So unbiasedness means this bias is zero identity for all values of theta. So an unbiased estimator is not one that has the correct expectation at a single theta, but every for all values of theta, okay? So for example, the, the estimator that we had here, uh, this guy, is this unbiased? Yeah. Okay, so only for one half, so then it's not unbiased. You can't say it's unbiased. Um, 
if, if the, the expectation matches the correct parameter that you can estimate in theta, it matches the correct parameter at one half, but uh, unbiased means for all the range of parameters, so this is not unbiased. The expectation of this turns out to be theta for all i and theta, so this is unbiased. So this one is unbiased, this is also unbiased. So both of these are unbiased, but you can think unbiased is not necessarily something very useful. Yeah. Sorry, which ones are unbiased? You found me. Uh, um, so not to. That one is. So the expectation of this is the sample mean expectation is going to be the same as the population, which is theta. So if you're estimating theta, this is unbiased for theta. Okay. So the expectation of delta one. is 1 over n summation i from 1 to n expectation of xi. This is theta, right? So 1 over n and theta, it's going to be theta. So if I'm just saying theta, this is my g theta, let's say. So this minus this is then, sorry, uh, theta, basically. Right, so this is the bias. Expectation of delta 1x minus theta that's the bias of delta one. Let's say this is going to be zero for all theta, it's identically zero. So this is unbiased. You do this for, for this, for delta two, this is going to be just one half. So you get one half. So the theta is going to be just zero at one half. No, not unbiased. It's not unbiased. Yes. This one is not unbiased. You can probably verify. This one is un this unbiased. Oh, the expectation of x one is theta. Yes. So theta times minus theta is zero for all theta. Yes. It's not useful because it's just one observation. It is not as useful because as we saw, it's dominated by this. So this has a much smaller variance, or the risk you can see. The risk of this actually goes down as a function of n, and this one is like constant. So unbiased is an interesting property, but on its own, it's not very useful. Okay. So Delta four is inadmissible. It is inadmissible, yes. Yes. Inadmissibility is related to the risk. Okay. Bias is related. It's like a different concept, but it's related to the quadratic risk. So is this sort of clear? Bias. Okay. Um so what else do we want to say about bias? So it's not always possible to find unbiased estimator, especially if gene data is like complicated. But Keener has an example where uh, in the binomial family, so X is binomial. In theta, which is related to our Bernoulli trial, as we'll see, if X is distri distributed like this, let's say theta is, this is like, um, in, in our experiment, if the, sum all the xi's and call the sum x. Uh, then the model reduces to this. x is binomial with n trials and, and theta is the prime probability. Uh, success in this model, if you try to, for example, um, estimate sine of theta for some reason, um, there is no estimator that's unbiased. Um, because if you write down the equation, if this is equal to like minus sine theta equals to zero, if you try to solve it, um, if, if there is a, there is an estimator that does this, it means that there's a polynomial that gives me n exactly equal to sine theta, and that's not possible. I'll leave it as a, like an exercise for you or, or your first for yourself. Uh, it's just a mathematical, um, interesting mathematical example. But um, if it's possible to find an unbiased estimator, then the parameter is called. Um, U estimable or unbiased estimable. So G is called U estimable or unbiased estimable if there is an unbiased estimator delta for G. Usually G theta is theta, and usually there is at least one unbiased estimator. It's a very um, mild uh, condition. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. This will come up later in a theorem. So. Um, so bias variance decomposition. Now we have seen this. That's what the quadratic law. 
um, let's say I'm just estimating theta, forget about g theta for now. Um, that's a quadratic loss. Um, the mean squared error is just the um, the risk under this quadratic loss, right? So this this is just the risk under quadratic loss. And in this case, so that will be the expectation. So this is the expectation of L of theta and delta of X, which is just expectation of theta minus delta of X squared. Okay, so that's the risk. It's all the other thing we see. This has the decomposition bias of delta S squared about the variance of delta S squared. Uh, and the proof is essentially what we did last time. I'm not going to repeat it. We just call the expectation of delta um, mu theta and then add and subtract mu theta and then expand the cross term goes away and you get that result. Yes. So for this proof, I'm still sort of confused about like um, the proper theta minus mu theta is that's how, why is that the variance of delta? Uh, delta minus mu theta squared the expectation. This is the variance. Uh -huh. uh, this is the expectation of delta. So this is like, if you want to, this is like my shorthand notation. But if you expand this, this is like expectation of mu theta is just the expectation of delta. That's how we define it here. Uh, minus delta n squared, right? And delta is really delta x also. Okay, right. something minus expectation squared, and then another expectation. But this is exactly if you go back to this thing that we did. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not repeating it. But if you do this calculation, why should we did it here? Yeah, so exactly this calculation. Add and subtract the mean of the estimator and then sign the cross term dimension. You have to verify for yourself. Um, and then it would be variance, and this would be bias, and you just replace this uh, x bar n with your desired estimator. So this is very general. Okay. It's a very good exercise to do it. If you haven't done it, just do it once. Verify for yourself in your own notation that this holds. So for MSE, uh, we have this bias variance decomposition, uh, which is very nice. Oftentimes, you can uh, use it to calculate the um, risk. Uh, and it tells you a lot about um, um, it's like what is going on in terms of there, there's a trade-off, in fact. So um, for different estimators, they have they, they trade off these two terms differently. So there are two extremes. One is uh, where the variance is zero. The other is the bias is zero. Okay. So can we have an estimator for which the variance is zero? Constant, constant functions are constant estimators. They have this, this is zero. But then usually this is very large. So one half, the example that we did, one half, uh, that is zero, it's all purely biased. There is a purely bias. Um, there are examples where the bias is zero. Okay, so those are unbiased estimators. Um, and those are usually good. I mean, but we may have seen examples of unbiased estimators for which the variance is large. That, that delta four, an invisible one. Um, and there could be estimators that trade these two off better than uh, unbiased estimators or the constant estimators. So this one, so this third one is not unbiased and it's trading off the variance and the bias uh, in a complicated fashion. And we saw that the risk is like, it's not easy to rule it out. So if you look at minimax, for example, estimated in, the, in a minimax, the maximum risk of this is less than that. So if your criteria is the maximum risk, this will be better. So you, you, if you come from a decision theoretic perspective, 
um, being unbiased is not necessarily um, the criteria that you're looking for. Okay, so the criteria is just the risk, and there could be biased estimators that have better risk performance in whatever metric you want. So um, traditionally, statisticians have been very um, um, like um, interested in unbiased estimators, but um, it's it's like if you care about risk, if you care about this, for example, like a prediction, uh, bias is not necessarily bad. Okay. Uh, maybe you can have a bit of bias and reduce the variance a lot. Uh, and a lot of regularized estimators do that. So when you regularize, you trade off, you add a bit of bias in uh, favor of the variance or to help reduce the variance a lot. Okay. Sounds good. Um, So this extends to higher dimensions. If you, for example, have vectors, you can replace this with the L2 norm. Um, higher dimensions. So this would be summation i from one to n and, and b, let's say, dimension theta i minus a i squared. So the same goes for the L2 norm squared. This calculation works out. So I'll let you figure that one as well. This variance would be a little bit different. Um, but once you write it down, you will see what replaces here. Um, OK. Questions? Um, this this example we did actually. So um, the um, the location normal location family in one dimension. If you um, look at these estimators that shrink, so the default estimator was. <laughs> one that you would come up with at first is x, but if I shrink it a little bit, you can see that it's less than one, then, um, oh, actually, for, for general, so you can calculate it using the, you can calculate the MSC using the bias variance decomposition, which we did sort of last time. Uh, if c is bigger than one, you can show that uh, delta one has a good MSC and delta c for all values of c. So for c bigger than one, we're inadmissible. But for C in 0 to 1, um, you get uh, those plots that the risk goes down uh, to 0, near 0. And, uh, or not, not, not to 0, but you would get this plot that one of, like the MLE has the uh, MLE corresponds to C41, where it's instead of C41, that the risk would be at 1. Uh, and then for C equal um, something less than 1, that's, that's, that's this, and so they're not comparable. Um, a very interesting phenomenon happens if you do this in higher dimension. So if, if you have x, which is normal with mean theta and um, identity covariance matrix, and d in dimension d, basically, d is bigger than or 3 or bigger than or equal to, I forgot, I'll say bigger than 3. Um, then you can also do the uh, MLE, which is going to be still x. Um, so theta is in our dimension, like uh, d dimensions. Um, the MLE would, would, would be constant. Again, the risk would be constant. Um, so in this case, the, the risk would be expectation of uh, theta minus delta x. OK. The, the norm is squared, so you're in higher dimensions. So for the so okay, the MLE I mentioned the MLE, but the the, the basic estimator 
for which this is x, this would be um, theta minus x squared. Um, anyone knows what, what this value would be? The norm of theta minus x squared expectation. Sorry? It would be the sum of the variances. Um, another way of saying it, it would be just the, you can show that this is just a trace of the covariance matrix, which would be D. Okay, and just do it for yourself. So the risk in this case would be um, for the MOE would be D. So this would be D. Um, there is an estimator in this case when D is large. Uh, you can show that, I mean, I'm, I'm showing the D-dimensional space. Uh, so you, you should imagine spherically symmetric risks. This is like a, like a cross section. Um, there's an estimator that does this. So probably zero, I forgot, yeah. Zero most likely, something like that. So you can, you can find an estimator whose risk is like completely below this. Um, yeah, it makes the, this thing about the altitude and the reason of the negative. That this perfectly fine looking estimator inadmissible. Uh, so this one is um, the one that has this is called the James Stein estimator, um, and you'll you'll see it in the homework and prove that this is the case. So it has caused a lot of surprise and uh, interest and. Like unbelievable, basically, result that there is something that just dominates the MLE in higher dimensions. And it's sometimes called a whole symmetric model. I'm not going to go into that too much, but it's it's an interesting fact. Under the quadratic loss, there is um, an estimator that just uh, that makes the MLE inadmissible. You'll see this in the homework, okay? Um, yeah. This is not precise. Uh, I mean, you can't say which one is better. Okay. That's what I mean. Yes. So there's no, it's like inconclusive. This is not, um, not formal terminology. And you can see all these, the, the ones that have C not equal to one, they're all biased. You can see this, this is basically the bias there, bias square. So we're dealing with biases. And this thing, the sign is also biased. Um, but, okay, any other questions? So the inadmissibility, bias, bias variance decomposition. Um, there's the James Stein estimator in this interesting, an interesting example of uh, inadmissibility. Um, here's another one, which is less, uh, it's, it's not as groundbreaking as the James Stein, but you can also show that in this case, also the MLE could become inadmissible. So if you have, uh, an example where xi's are exponential from an exponential distribution where it's very lambda. Um, and I want to estimate parameter lambda. Okay, if you want to motivate it a little bit better, you can think of the Poisson process. Um, Poisson process sort of is a discrete count, counting process, right? Uh, the, the arrivals of like certain things. Let's say that the email, your email, for example, might follow Poisson process, the times at which the emails arrive in your mailbox, they're random. Um, but they arrive at a certain rate and the Poisson process is, is one of these canonical processes for modeling uh, uh, these type of random events, okay? 
Uh, and in the Poisson process, the interarrival times are independent and they're exponential. Okay, so the time between the first email and the next one is a random variable, which is exponential. I mean, the, the time here is also an exponential. Random variables are independent. So if you want to estimate the rate of Poisson process, you can look at these interarrival times and you can model the problem at other than sequence of exponential variables. Um, so that's the motivation, maybe, for why you want to look at this. Um, and so we're going to dispense with the formalism. We're not going to formally specify things. Um, just um, in order to, like, we can basically think of the family as the um, um, set of um, probability measures indexed by lambda on, on this vector. Okay, if you want to be formal. Uh, and those probability measures have um, um, densities with respect to the bank measure, n dimensional the bank measure, and that would be the density. Um, so here x is um, a vector, and the density factorizes uh, into these uh, marginals. Again, the product is marginal because it's by, by, by independence, and I'm using a bit of a um, like I'm using notation because this is the notation for the joint. I'm also using it for the um, marginals. If you want, you can put a one here to distinguish. This is a function on taking real value objects from the case and the eventual labor. So for simplicity, I'm going to usually write, write it like this. And don't worry too much about notation. Uh, sorry. Not going to write it like this unless we have to specify. But this is basically um, um, known. It's just the density of an exponential random variable, um, which looks like this. And I add this indicator here to make sure that um, things are non negative. So the density of an um, exponential random variable, if you look at it as a um, function in R, it's going to be zero for the negative values and then going to come down uh, from zero down to again jumps to lambda and then drops the rate lambda so that's the density so that's where this um, comes in so I'm, I'm putting it here um, if my underlying measure is the lave it has like mass everywhere i just want to make sure that the density is zero um, where x's are negative. So then you multiply out, and it's not hard to see that you get uh, lambda to the n, and this exponential uh, has this property. Right? So the product of e to the negative lambda xi is e to the negative lambda sum of xi's. And then the product of these um, indicators, I can write it as this. So. Uh, Product of which indicator is the indicator of the intersection that all of them happen. All of them happen at the minimal xi is bigger than zero. So that's a compact way of writing the density. Okay. Once we have this density, then we're in business, we can do whatever we want. Okay. Um, questions about this? So the parameter space you take it to be zero to infinity. Uh, action space within the parameter space. These are rates, so they're non-negative. And we're going to not assume that lambda is zero because that's like a singular case. Okay. So yes. Are there any for? Poisson process. Uh, process doesn't necessarily have a probability mass. Function. So Poisson process is a random process. So this is the PN, right? So Poisson process has a lot of things attached to it. So the, the counts and then, so we're looking at, let's say, interarrival times, which are exponential. So this is really the density of exponential right the way. So the Poisson process was just motivated. Yeah. But once you look at the interarrival type, which is the contiguous as x1, this is as x2, 
then you can forget about the Poisson process. I mean, this is a property of the Poisson process. You can check that entire arrival times are by Poisson. But once you're there, you can just work with the exponential. Oh, yeah, no, it's not Poisson distribution. It's a Poisson process. So the counts are going to be Poisson distributed. So if you look at it, like how many events are in a certain interval, that's the count of the events is Poisson. It lambda times the length of the interval. But the interval times are exponential. But, um, okay. So now that we have this, so how do we estimate you know, hide this? How do we estimate the lambda? What is a good estimate of lambda? What do you like propose? So MMI is zero. Uh who's who's talking? Oh, okay. So MLE might be one Yes, okay. So what is MLE? The maximum likelihood estimator. So what is maximum likelihood estimator? Also the right window of having that data, which is the lambda. Right. But then okay. So yeah, the, 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 the key thing is the likelihood. What is the likelihood that I have to maximize? This is the data given. Uh who's talking? Okay. It's the probability of this realization given data. Right. Right. Given like in this case, lambda. Okay. So the problem yeah. is that we see is given lambda, like the Um. So given is um. Usually when you say given, you you think like a Bayesian model. So there's like parameter given this parameter, but that's fine. I mean, it's like if you imagine uh, the probability under uh, p lambda like the, the each, each one of these lambdas define a probability distribution. Okay. So under that particular lambda, what is the probability they observe this uh, observation? I change the lambda, what is the probability now? I change it. So you, you're going to change lambda and look for a lambda under whose corresponding probability this is this event is most probable. Okay. That's the maximum likelihood. Um, and another way of saying it is that the likelihood is actually this guy is easiest if you. Think think of it as as a statistician. They look at so this should look at this like a joint PDF. And if your problem is you you see x, so it's like a function of x. So that's the, the mass. The mass like the distribution is like um it's like let's say, okay, let me do it with the normal one. X is normal theta one. Okay, the PDF is um one over root two pi. Uh, x squared over two. Right, right. So um, if you're a probabilist, so you'd say, okay, this is theta maybe. Um, I'm going to look at this PDF and it's like bell shaped, as they say. Uh, it has this form, okay? As a function of x, so that's as a function of x is PDF. Uh, the way statisticians look at it is okay. I'm actually observing the x, so there is a fixed x that I observed. Uh, maybe here. Uh, what I want to do is uh, see what is the probability of this particular event under various parameters as I vary the parameter. So when you vary the parameter, you evaluate the probability of this. So under, for example, this previous guy, uh, the probability like is roughly, uh, imagine like x times, it's like px times dx, okay? Is that if I change theta, uh, the probability would be different under this one is that higher. So, so this one has this theta uh, and so on. So I'm going to move it, and you can see in this case, if I move it here, it has the largest probability. So when theta measures x. Um, so you view basically this guy as a function of theta for a fixed x. So that's called the likelihood. If I want to plot it in this case, 
uh, the likelihood would be a function of theta for that particular x that we saw. It has the same form, but it's now just at x is maximized. Okay. In this case, the, uh, the function of x it looks like the same as function of theta because it's sort of symmetric. Uh, but in general, look at the density of the function of theta for a fixed x, that's the likelihood that the statistician work. And then we really maximize the likelihood to look like that. Value uh, of theta at which the likelihood is maximized, which is x. So x is the other. Um, the rationale is again, as pointed out, this quantity is. Uh, so you, you look at the distribution on the theta and you evaluate what is the probability of seeing this event. <clears throat> you're changing the theta to, uh, to find the parameter under which we have uh, the most probable, like the, it's most probable to observe this particular observation, okay? But just to simplify your life, just look at this as a function of the parameter for a fixed observation. That's the likelihood to maximize that Like The rational is, is what we have. So in this case, it's gonna be a little bit different. So. Um, if I look at the likelihood, for example, here, I'm not plotting it as a function of, so imagine this is as a function of x, it's a multivariate distribution. As a function of parameter, it's a univariate thing I can plot it, right? So if I want to plot the likelihood here, um, what would it look like? Anyone has a guess? So at zero, it's going to be zero. At infinity, it's going to be yeah, zero. zero because the exponential is very fast. So it's going to come up and then go back down. So there is really a maximum. Okay, and then this maximum we can find by differentiating, right? Find the derivative. And so this is going to be the likelihood. And it turns out that if I have the sum of them, if I call the sum S, then um, the, the, the sample mean would be one over N times S. The MLE for lambda, this lambda hat would be um, one over x bar or n over s. Um, this makes sense because if you remember, this is a ray um, and these are times. Okay? So uh, the expectation of any one of them is actually one over lambda. Um, and so when I take the average, basically I'm, I'm looking at the average, like the, 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 the average time or the expected time, which is one over lambda. Then I invert it, that would give me an estimate of the rate. rate. Okay. So this is a good estimate for the right slide. This is the end of it. Okay. Sounds good. Questions? So we learned about the MLE. Um, it's N over S. Um, now let's say if I want to calculate the bias and the value, uh, things are a little bit more tricky because it's not X bar. Like the expectation is not easy to calculate, right? So if I want to calculate the expectation of lambda hat, um, it's expectation of N over S. So N I can pull out. Uh, but I'm hoping that everyone uh, understands that I can't just do one over expectation of lambda s. Okay, expectation doesn't sort of commute with nonlinear operations, so this is not correct. It's close actually, but not correct. But I'm stuck with this, so what should I do? Can I still do? I still calculate something like that. If I want to calculate the bias, I need the expectation. So if you're good at probability, once you have the density or distribution, you could do anything, calculate anything. Just probably not with those form, but you can integrate, right? You can integrate against this. So it's going to be like integral one over summation xi, P theta or P lambda x1 up to xn, dx1 up to xn, and then just compute it. 
over um, and write it R positive n over the positive or. So if you calculate this integral, um, as it turns out, I mean, you can also calculate the entire distribution of this. The distribution of one over S uh, turns out to be, um, so S is, turns out to have a gamma distribution. Um, and one over S, people call it inverse gamma for obvious reasons. So if this is gamma distributed, one over S has inverse gamma and you can calculate the PDF of it as, as well using the techniques from basic probability. Um, you either do this calculation or just calculate the, uh, basically the distribution of this and also the distribution of one over S um, so inverse gamma. Um, if you're lazy, you can just look at this Wikipedia page for this and look at the calculator. But I hope you understand how to do it if, if you need it, okay? Uh, this has to have it, like this one has a name, but in general, you should be able to calculate the expectation, however complicated it is, at least numerically. But in this case, the inverse gamma is that, and then if you look at Wikipedia, lambda over n minus one, the expectation of an inverse gamma. If there's mu n, lambda over n minus one. Um, and so the expectation of lambda hat is n times the expectation of one over s, so you get n times lambda divided by n minus one. So that turns out to be the this. And so this is not, um, so lambda hat is not unbiased for lambda because I would have liked this to be lambda. It's like slightly different than that. So the MLE is not unbiased in this case. Okay. So how do we make it unbiased? In this case, it's very simple. Sorry. Okay. Uh, that will be asymptotically unbiased. I want it to be perfectly unbiased for like even like n is three. I can make it on make it make it as estimated as unbiased. Yes. Multiplied by a right. That's that's the easiest. So, yes, just 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 for this factor, right? So you have the MLE define a new estimator which is like n minus one times n times lambda hat. Then expectation of lambda tilde would be n minus uh, times expectation of lambda hat, this linear comes out. So this is, this factor is going to cancel that. Oh, okay. um, in over n minus one. Oh, no, sorry. That was correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is n, the device is n. And, uh, and so the expectation is 10 times lambda because n minus one. I flip that three factor, multiply. This is going to have expectation lambda. Okay. Sounds good. So this new estimator, which is just a tiny modification of this, is unbiased. Okay. Um, as it happens, it also has a smaller variance. Why? Has a smaller variance than the MLE. It's like a constant, and this constant is less than one. So the variance of the lambda tilde is this constant the squared times the variance of this. So this constant is smaller than one, the squared is even smaller. So the variance of lambda tilde is less than lambda. So the variance of delta tilde is smaller strictly, assuming that the variance of lambda hat is not zero, which is not zero. Uh, the variance smaller, the bias is better. So that has a like non-negative bias, and a non-zero bias, this has zero bias. So the overall MSE would be better. So the MSE of this guy is strictly better than the MSE of lambda. Yes. Would well, you say that there's a simpler way to, I mean, this is the time this is intended, but is there a simpler way to compute what the variance of uh, lambda hat would be? There is a way. Uh, we're avoiding it. So, so in order to do this analysis, you don't need to calculate the variance, but you, you, you can calculate the variance of lambda hat. How do we calculate the variance of lambda hat? 
There's the Wikipedia road, route. There is the non-Wikipedia. You can find the uh, second moment. Second moment, yeah. So basically, you have to do a bunch of integrals because he's the third digit. So the Wikipedia road is the variance of lambda hat is n. So this is this. So n squared times the variance of one over s, right? And one over s, if you believe me, has inverse gamma. So you can put the variance of inverse gamma multiplied by n squared. That we put that so if you want to do the integral, you can do the integral, right? But the variance, you can do the second moment, and then you have the first moment, and then from the second moment, the first moment, you calculate the variance. As long as you just have the mean for so the mean so um so these are exponential okay and then the s will have at least this part you can easily use s this is known but you can also prove this that this is going to have a gamma distribution gamma in and lambda has a certain pdf uh, and then from this, you can get the PDF of uh, one over S by the transformation of variables. The, the, this is a, the, 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 the map that maps F. So imagine this map. This map is differentiable, smooth. Um, there are rules in probability translate densities from one random variable to a, another function of the random variable involving the Jacobi and stuff. In this case, right with their, so you can calculate the PDF of this. Once you have the PDF of this, this is a new random variable called this. I don't know why. You have the PDF of it, and then you calculate uh, y squared f y dy. That would be the second moment. And you also calculate the first moment, uh, and then the second moment minus the first moment squared with the variance. Okay. Yeah. If you really like, you should do all of this. And um, it's a good exercise in probability. Uh, but the argument that I did here avoids calculating the variance. Because, okay? I mean, in a simple case, just you know that whatever the variance of this is, the variance is going to be smaller. And the bias is zero. So you have this relation. It shows that lambda hat, the MLE, is not admissible. Right, because I found another estimator which strictly dominates it. But this domination is small, as, as pointed out. So these two estimators are going to get close as n goes to infinity. But let's say if n is like 3, uh, there is a difference. So for small samples, um, if you care about the MSE, this is a better estimator. Okay. Um, sounds good? This is an example where uh, we do this. Uh, the point of this example beyond uh, what I mentioned about inadmissibility is that um, everything depends on the loss. So if I change the loss, the story completely changes. Uh, there's this particular loss. This is not quadratic. It's not symmetric. Some people call it the top row of say so. Um, if you use this particular loss, um, which I believe, so quadratic loss penalizes uh, overestimation in our case because the, the lambda is um, non negative, right? So if I have, for example, lambda is two, the true lambda is two, for example, if you look at the, the let's say, um, quadratic loss, if the actual lambda, let's say, is two, um, you're going to have this. And then goes goes all the way to infinity. Uh, can't go negative. Okay. So um, you're penalizing higher values more in a sense. Uh, very exciting. I don't see that. But you can penalize. Let's say if I penalize the higher values less and then lower values more, this this loss is going to do something like that. Uh, then it turns out that you can show. The relation thing. So under this loss, now the kills that it is strictly dominated by the MLE. So then the MLE makes the other one inadmissible. 
Um, it's just something to keep in mind. It's very sensitive to the loss. And that's the point of this exam. Yes. So does that mean that this, this loss function or no loss function makes sense for uh, functions that are strictly positive? Uh, I'm not necessarily saying it makes sense, but if, if let's say you want to penalize, so whatever you want to do, you have to choose the loss according. So this um, over penalizes, like this is this penalizes the overestimation much less and underestimation much more. So if you're in a situation where you care about underestimation, you should use this. So you don't want to underestimate. You want to like, it's like a critical thing that you have to get it at least as good as the true one. Maybe overestimation is not bad, but underestimation will be penalized. So then you use this. Otherwise, you use something else. That's on the situation. Yes, yes. So um, that's that. Um, this particular loss is an example of what's called the Bregman divergence, which you can you can use Bregman divergences as losses. They um, start from some um, convex function, and then you do Taylor expansion around like point and y. Taylor expansion by point y. This is the first order Taylor expansion, and this is the the remainder. The remainder is going to be a function of both x and y. It's called Bregman divergence. And this is a good source of loss functions. Um, this is an example. There are others. So this has a lot of uh, use in machine learning and uh, optimization, just as a side. OK, uh, these are the details. I think there might be a homework problem, actually, in, in, in that you show this. OK. Um, questions? Okay, questions. So we ran out of slides here. So let's move on to the next topic. So we talked about um, um, decision theory. Let's switch to a slightly different topic and then we'll come back to what I mentioned, the UMVU. So we're gonna talk about sufficiency for a while. And this is an interesting uh, classical idea in statistics. Um, we still have the same setup of decision theory. We have a parametric family of models, or say, parametric family of distributions of probability model um, for our experiment. And um, the sufficiency idea is that we can separate the data into parts that are relevant for estimating the parameter and, and the parts that are irrelevant. We throw out the irrelevant part. Uh, the parts that are relevant are called sufficient, the irrelevant part sometimes called ancillary. Uh, there are clear advantages to this. So if I can throw away data, then I can compress my data. Maybe if I want to communicate or store in the like um, uh, in the past, these things were very um, um, expensive. Let's say you want to communicate a data set. There was no like internet or something like that. So maybe one bit of information if I can give you that's all the information you need. I'm going to just give you that. But um, um, so that that's that, then the irrelevant parts also can increase the risk. So if you keep them and build your estimator out of them, uh, they can actually have statistical uh, influence in a negative way. So you really want to get them out. And this really interesting, uh, interesting result called Raw Black one here. Yeah. So let's see what sufficiency is. Uh, so I have this model. Um, it's a collection of probability distribution parameters by theta. Um, we look at a statistic. Uh, so a statistic um, is any function of the data. Okay. Um, so it doesn't depend on the parameter specifically. So I look at the function of the data, uh, which I both use t and t of x. So it's it's a function as a function t of x. Once I apply it, it's just a random variable. So we, we view it in both ways. So this particular statistic is, is said to be sufficient for this family or for the parameter or for x, whatever you want to call it. If uh, this holds, the conditional distribution of x given t does not depend on theta. 
So when I calculate the condition of this of x given t, um, uh, under any of these t datas, potentially it depends on data. But if you're in a situation where t is chosen such that when I calculate this, under any of these t datas, I get the same thing. So the kind of data, then t is sufficient for this model. Um, a bit more formally, um, if A is an event, uh, if I calculate the probability of X belonging to A conditional on T in equal to T uh, under P theta, this turns out to be something like Q T of A. So it depends on T, it depends on A, but it doesn't depend on theta. Um, formally, this we're going to assume that this is a probability measure uh, and it's sort of a Markov kernel, essentially. So what is a Markov kernel? It's, it's a function uh, that takes T and an event and maps them to the probability. So if you know about Markov processes, um, the step at the current state T, what is the probability that end up in set A? There is a transition kernel to tell me that. And so. Um, this is this is something like that. But for for like, if if it bothers you, don't worry about it. It's just that this quantity doesn't depend on theta. Okay. So when I once I can compute the conditional distribution of x given t, there's no theta anymore. Okay. It's just a completely determined distribution um, based on the model. So I don't need the theta to actually um, evaluate this distribution. Okay, yes. I'm sorry, just clarify. So that a uh, that's not the same as that action space. No, 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 no. This is an event. Event. Right. I'm computing the probability that it belongs to some set. It's a set. Oh. Set. Um. So, in other words. Um, another way of saying what sufficiency is, is that if you give me T, I can simulate the data uh, that is statistically equivalent to original data. So you have X, uh, you calculate T of X, you give me T of X and throw X away. I can simulate X back uh, because I have T and then I draw X given T from this condition of distribution. This criteria does not depend on theta, so I don't need to know theta. So I get a distribution of x back. So I, I get an x back which has the, the correct distribution. We'll have the distribution t theta. Um, the depend the t carries the information about theta. So the distribution of t carries the information about theta. Once I have t, I can re-simulate or recreate x by sampling from this conditional distribution. Uh, I get a different x, the original x, but x has the correct distribution, has p theta distribution, which I can use to estimate theta. This very clearly shows that you really don't need x, you just need t. t captures all the information about theta. Okay, it's a subtle concept, but we'll see examples more. Let's see what, but at this point, any questions? Let me give you an example, uh, then it becomes a little more clear. So suppose you had the Bernoulli uh, trial example that we had. Um, I'm gonna use this notation, capital X um, for the random variable, rule X for the realization. So the realization of capital X is this little X. So we claim, or we wanna show that um, the sum the sum of these xi's is sufficient. Okay, if I um, basically observe this Bernoulli trial, I get a sequence of zeros and ones. And intuitively, if I want to estimate theta, I don't need the sequence. I just need how many ones there are, the sum, right? That's the intuition. So that's what sufficiency captures. Um, in which, so let's say if the sum is four, 
uh, whether I observe this sequence or another sequence, which has, again, four ones in it in a different order, um, they carry the same amount of information in a sense. Okay, So it doesn't matter whether this was observed or this was observed. I can throw away the order. I can just keep the number of ones. That's what sufficiency sort of um, tries to formalize. Um, so let's try to see if we can prove this. The, the PMF here, we did the calculation, turns out to be, so it's the product of these, uh, and it would be, uh, if you recall, summation, theta summation xi, and then one minus theta, n minus summation xi. So that's, that's the way we wrote the PMF of the variable variable, and the simplified to that, uh, because T of x is, uh, the summation, I can just, just write the p of little x here. n minus p of little x. And you can see that the probability mass function can be reconstructed from this t of x. Um, I don't need the individual x size. So if I want to formally show uh, that t is sufficient, I just have to calculate the conditional distribution of x given t. Uh, and for that, we start with the joint distribution. Uh, and then I divide by the marginal distribution of t. So t theta of x equal x, given t equal t is p theta of x equal x, t equal t divided by p theta of t equal t. Um, so this is the tricky part because T is a function of x. Uh, figuring what this is is a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm going to write this as T of capital X. Okay. Uh, it's just the sum of all the x's. But because I already know that x is really equal to little x, then this is really going to be also T of little x. Because on that event, capital X is equal to little x. Now this p of x equal t is deterministic. Okay, so the same that if we pick x, the sequence, and t, uh, this is saying whether the sum of the elements of x matches by t or not. If it matches, then this is back here. If it's not, then this event would be empty. Can't happen. Okay, pick any sequence x, any t. This either holds or does not hold. Okay. So I can say if if it falls, if it falls with t of x is equal to t, then I just have the probability of x is equal to x. Uh, otherwise it's zero. So that's uh, what this notation is doing. So this is an indicator. Either t of o x is equal to t, or it's not. Uh, if it's equal to t, then it's equal to t of x is equal to x. Otherwise it's not. not. So imagine, for example, that this sequence, this is x and t is phi then this can't happen. Uh, but if, if x is this and t is four, it can happen. And it would just be the probability of the sequence. So that's that. And then I have this here. Um, under that indicator, t of x is equal to t, I, I can just replace t of x with t. So the second step is just replacing um, t of x with t. Um, maybe just bear with me one more minute. Um, I can then calculate the, so that's the same thing. I can then calculate the marginal by just summing over the marginal x. And sum over all x, then I sum over all x, it passes through this part because this part now doesn't depend on x. Uh, it just hits this part. So I, I get something like that. Okay, so I get this, I have the sum. Um, and this sum is easy to, to show this and choose to. It's just counting how many sequences have sum equal to t. So I have sequences of length n, how many are um, equal to t. So that's it. That's that. I divide these two by each other. So this part cancels out, right? Uh, and I end up with basically the indicator divided by n to t. So you can see this does not depend on theta. So the dependence of theta cancels out. So the conditional distribution x given t equal to t is um, 
something that doesn't depend on T. So this proves that uh, T is sufficient. For the next time, I, I uh, encourage you to think about what this distribution is. Okay. Can you like intuitively say what this is? And we'll come back, maybe do it a little bit, uh, comment a little bit more because you're out of time. And if you have questions, uh, we go over them and then continue with uh, sufficiency and factorization theory. Okay, sounds good. Okay, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.